Tokyo Terror, exploring urban legends in Japan's megacity I always believed that Tokyo, with its neon-lit streets and bustling crowds, held secrets darker than the night itself. My first night in the city proved me right. As a writer of urban legends, I came here searching for stories, but what I found was beyond anything I had ever imagined. The evening air was chilly, a stark contrast to the warmth of the izakaya where I had spent the last few hours. Streets buzzed with energy, yet a silent whisper seemed to follow me as I walked through Shinjuku's narrow alleys. It was then I heard about the legend of the Yuriai of Yatsuya. According to locals, this vengeful spirit had been sighted in the very heart of this district, wailing and causing unease among the night owls. Curiosity peaked, I ventured deeper into the area, my steps echoing on the cobblestone paths. The lights dimmed as I moved away from the main street, the shadows growing longer and more menacing. A cat scurried past, its eyes glowing like tiny embers in the dark. It stopped and looked back at me, as if warning me of the path ahead. Undeterred, I continued, my heart pounding with every step. I reached an old park, the gates creaking as I pushed them open. The moon was hidden behind clouds, casting eerie shadows across the abandoned swings and slides. That's when I felt it, a cold gust of wind brushing past me, carrying with it a faint, sorrowful sob. Turning around, I expected to see a lost child or a stray animal, but there was nothing. The sobbing grew louder, a mournful lament that seemed to resonate with the very soul of the park. I followed the sound, drawn to it by a mix of fear and fascination. Near the old cherry tree at the park's edge, the air grew inexplicably cold. My breath turned to mist as I exhaled, watching it swirl around me like spectral fingers. The sobbing stopped abruptly, replaced by a chilling silence that seemed to press against my ears. I squinted into the darkness, and that's when I saw her. A figure, draped in white, her face obscured by the length of her unkempt hair. She was floating slightly above the ground, her presence ethereal yet terrifying. I froze, my mind screaming for me to run, but my body refused to obey. She moved towards me, her movements slow and deliberate. The closer she got, the colder the night became. Why do you disturb me? Her voice was a whisper, yet it pierced the silence with the sharpness of a blade. I struggled to find my voice, my throat dry and tight. I. I'm here to learn about you, to tell your story, I managed to say, my words barely a whisper. She tilted her head, considering my words. Then, slowly, she began to fade, becoming more transparent with each passing second. Just before she vanished completely, she pointed towards the heart of the park. I didn't understand then, but I knew I had to follow. As I approached the spot she had indicated, the ground beneath me felt unstable. I looked down to find that I was standing on a barely discernible trapdoor. With trembling hands, I opened it, revealing a set of narrow, winding stairs leading into darkness. Descending the stairs, I entered a realm of whispers and shadows. The air was thick with the scent of damp earth and something sweet, rotting. At the bottom, a dimly lit corridor stretched before me, its walls lined with old, fading photographs. Each picture was of the park above, but in each one, the cherry tree was prominent, and beneath it, a different figure posed, their faces blurred, their eyes hollow. I walked the corridor, my footsteps muffled by the thick dust. The end of the hall was shrouded in darkness, and as I neared it, the air grew colder, the whispers louder. They were voices now, pleading, warning, crying out in despair. I reached out, my hand brushing against something cold and metallic. A lantern, ancient and covered in cobwebs. I struck a match, the flame flickering weakly against the oppressive darkness. The light revealed a large, ornate mirror standing against the wall. Its surface was dusty, but I could see my reflection staring back at me, pale and wide-eyed. But I wasn't alone in the reflection. Behind me stood the figures from the photographs, their expressions twisted in silent screams. I turned around, but the corridor was empty. When I looked back into the mirror, they were moving closer, 
their hands reaching out towards me. The lantern fell from my trembling hands, shattering on the ground. The light went out, plunging me into darkness. The last thing I heard before everything went silent was the sound of the mirror cracking, the shards falling like rain in the still air. And then, nothing but the darkness, waiting to reveal its next secret. In the pitch darkness, my heart hammered against my chest, each beat echoing ominously in the void. The silence was suffocating, oppressive, as if the very air had been drained of sound. I groped blindly for the broken pieces of the lantern, my fingers brushing against cold, sharp edges of glass. Who are you? What do you want from me? My voice sounded foreign in the enveloping darkness, trembling and weak. There was no answer, only the echo of my own voice bouncing off unseen walls. I struggled to my feet, disoriented and scared. My only thought was to find a way out, to escape the claustrophobic corridor and its ghostly inhabitants. I shuffled forward, hands stretched out in front of me, touching the damp, rough surface of the wall. It guided me, leading me deeper into the labyrinthine underbelly of the park. As I moved, faint whispers returned, like the rustling of leaves in a soft breeze. They grew in intensity, forming coherent sentences that chilled my spine. Leave this place, one voice hissed, so close I could almost feel the breath on my ear. Never return, another voice joined, its tone mournful. Ignoring the warnings, I continued, driven by a mix of fear and an insatiable need to discover the secrets that lay buried here. The corridor twisted and turned, and with each step, the air grew colder, more biting. I shivered, my breath visible in brief, ghostly puffs. Suddenly, a soft light glowed ahead, a beacon in the relentless dark. My pace quickened, hope surging in my chest. The light emanated from beneath a door at the corridor's end. I pushed it open with shaking hands, stepping into a small, round chamber. The room was unlike any part of the tunnel I had traversed. The walls were lined with ancient tapestries, depicting scenes of life and death joy and despair, each more vivid and haunting than the last. In the center of the room, a single candle burned on a wrought iron stand, its flame casting tall, dancing shadows. As I approached the candle, the flame flickered violently, as though agitated by my presence. I reached out to stabilize it, but before my fingers could touch the warm wax, a cold hand gripped my wrist. I spun around, my scream caught in my throat, Standing before me was a figure, cloaked in darkness, its face obscured by the hood of its robe. Only its eyes were visible, glowing a faint, eerie blue. You should not have come here, the figure spoke, its voice a cold whisper that seemed to freeze the very air. Why? I managed to ask, my voice barely a whisper. What is this place? This is where forgotten stories lie, the figure replied releasing my wrist. Stories that should never be unearthed. You have awakened them, and they are hungry. The walls seem to pulse with a newfound energy, the tapestries fluttering as if caught in a breeze. Faces within the fabric turn towards me, their eyes pleading, angry, sorrowful. What do they want? I asked, backing away from the encroaching shadows. They want to be remembered, the figure said stepping closer. But some tales are better left forgotten, lest they consume the living. I felt a chill spread through my body, a dread that settled deep in my bones. The room grew colder, the candle's flame now a mere flicker in the overwhelming darkness. Leave now, while you still can, the figure warned, pointing back towards the corridor. I needed no further urging. I turned and ran, the corridor now filled with the whispers of a hundred voices, each more desperate than the last. They called to me, beckoning me to stay, to listen, to remember them. But fear lent speed to my feet, driving me back the way I had come. The tunnel seemed endless, a perpetual loop of darkness and whispers. Just as I thought I would be trapped forever in this subterranean nightmare, a faint light appeared, signaling the way back to the park. I burst out of the trapdoor, gasping for air, 
the night sky a vast, open canvas compared to the oppressive darkness below. The park was silent, the ghostly presence of the woman by the cherry tree gone as if she had never been. Exhausted and terrified, I stumbled through the streets of Tokyo, the city that now seemed alien and menacing. The bright lights of Shinjuku mocked my fear, the laughing faces of passers-by oblivious to the darkness I had escaped. But I knew I couldn't ignore the stories I had stirred. They clung to me, spectral threads woven into my own life's tapestry. They whispered of unfinished business, of tales that demanded to be told. And deep down, I knew I would return. The secrets of that dark place called to me, a siren song I was powerless to resist. But for now, I needed to prepare, to gather my strength for the next descent into the shadows. For the stories were waiting, and they would not be denied. Driven by an inexplicable force, I found myself drawn back to the park night after night. Each visit, the pull of the hidden stories beneath the earth grew stronger, an incessant whisper in the back of my mind. Tokyo's sprawling cityscape became a distant reality as the park's supernatural enigma enveloped me, blurring the lines between the known and the unknown. As the days turned to weeks, my encounters became more intense, more vivid. Each venture below the surface revealed new horrors, new facets of the tortured souls whose stories had been sealed away in the darkness. The corridors beneath the park seemed to shift with each visit, never the same path twice, as if the very walls were alive, breathing and undulating with the whispers of the past. One night, as the moon cast a silvery glow over the city, I descended deeper than ever before. The air was thick with a palpable dread that weighed on my chest, making each breath an effort. My only light, a flickering torch, cast long, sinister shadows against the damp walls, the light playing tricks on my eyes, or so I hoped. Come closer, a voice called out, a melodic whisper that was almost comforting amidst the oppressive darkness. I followed the sound to a large cavern, its ceilings lost in shadow. In the center of the room, a pool of water reflected the torchlight, its surface perfectly still. As I approached, the water began to ripple, disturbed by a force unseen. Images appeared in the water, scenes of lives once lived, a samurai warrior meeting his end on a foggy battlefield, a woman in kimono, her face streaked with tears as she awaited a lover who would never return, children playing near the cherry tree, their laughter echoing across years into nothingness. The reflections shifted, becoming darker, more urgent. The pool showed me the park above, but altered, twisted by shadows that writhed beneath the moonlight. Figures roamed the paths, their faces hollow, their steps aimless. They were the lost souls, bound to the park, bound to their stories that clawed for recognition, for release. Why do you show me this? I asked the pool, my voice a hoarse whisper. To remember us is to free us, it answered, the voice coming from all around, a chorus of the damned. But at what cost? I countered, fear tightening its grip around my heart. Every story has its price, the voices sang in unison. The water stilled once more, and in it, I saw my own reflection. But I was not alone. Behind me stood all the figures I had seen, their eyes pleading, their hands reaching out towards me. I turned, expecting to confront them, but the cavern was empty. When I looked back at the pool, the surface was clear, as if nothing had ever disturbed it. Determined to end the cycle, to free these souls and myself, I ventured further, guided by the whispers and the shifting paths that seemed to chart my course through the darkness. The corridor led me to an ancient library, the walls lined with scrolls and books, each containing the stories of those trapped within the park. I reached for a scroll, its paper brittle and aged. As I unrolled it, the script danced before my eyes, the characters alive, their stories unfolding in my mind with vivid, terrifying clarity. The room filled with their voices, each tale overlapping until the air vibrated with their urgency. This is how we are freed, a new voice joined, clear and commanding. I spun around to face a figure cloaked in white, its face obscured but its presence unmistakably powerful. Read our stories, share our tales. Only then will the shadows lift, and peace be restored, it instructed. 
but how can I bear the weight of all this sorrow? I asked, my voice breaking under the strain. You were chosen because you can endure, it replied, stepping closer. Do not falter now, when so much is at stake. With a resolve born of necessity rather than courage, I agreed, taking up the scrolls. The figure nodded, its form beginning to fade like mist at dawn. Return here with the stories known, and the cycle will break, it said as it vanished, leaving me alone with the weight of a thousand souls. As I ascended back to the surface, the first light of dawn touched the edges of the sky, painting the world in hues of hope and despair. I knew my journey was far from over. The stories I carried were not just tales of the past, they were keys to unlocking the shadows that had taken root in the park. And so, with the city of Tokyo stirring to life around me, I prepared to face the world, armed with the haunted whispers of the park, ready to tell their tales, to free their spirits, and perhaps, find my own salvation in the process. With the ancient scrolls in hand, I walked through the waking streets of Tokyo, feeling the weight of centuries on my shoulders. The city around me buzzed with the usual morning chaos, but I moved through it like a specter, disconnected yet burdened by a purpose only I could fulfill. Back in my small, dimly lit apartment, I spread the scrolls across the floor, their edges curling like dry leaves. Each scroll was a repository of pain, a testament to lives once vibrant but now reduced to mere whispers in the dark. I began to read, aloud, each word echoing in the sparse room, as if the very walls were listening. As I spoke, the air around me grew colder, the shadows deeper. The candle I had lit flickered violently, casting grotesque shapes against the walls. I felt eyes upon me, the gazes of those whose stories I read, their souls inching closer to the realm of the living with every word I uttered. The first scroll told of a samurai betrayed by his closest ally, his spirit unable to rest. As I recounted his tale, a gust of wind swept through the room, scattering the other scrolls. The candle snuffed out, plunging the room into darkness. Only the light of dawn filtering through the window allowed me to see the faint outline of a figure, bowing deeply before fading away. With each story, the phenomena grew stronger, more tangible. A woman in a kimono appeared as I read her love-laden suicide note, her tear-streaked visage so clear it could have been real. She whispered a thanks that brushed my ears like a lover's caress before dissipating into a sigh. Hours passed, each minute stretching into eternity as I worked through the scrolls. The apartment became a nexus of the supernatural, each apparition more vivid than the last. The room grew so cold that my breath became a frosty mist, and I could see my breath as I spoke the final words of the last story, a child's playful farewell to the world, his life cut tragically short by illness. As the last syllable trembled into silence, a profound stillness took hold. The oppressive atmosphere lifted like a fog at sunrise, the room instantly warming as if the sun had touched its very center. I looked around, half expecting another apparition, but there was only peace. A peace so deep, it settled into my bones, a stark contrast to the haunting turmoil of the past weeks. The weight that had pressed down on me lifted, and for the first time since entering that dark park, I breathed easily. But the true confirmation came later. I returned to the park, drawn by a need to see the place where it all began. The day was bright, the sun casting brilliant patterns through the leaves of the cherry tree that had stood as a silent witness to the horrors and histories beneath. As I approached the trap door, a subtle fear gripped me, would opening it unleash the horrors anew? But when I lifted the heavy lid, there was nothing but an empty, silent tunnel. The whispers were gone, the chill of memory. The park was just a park, the tree just a tree, and the stories, the stories were finally at rest. Walking back through the park, I felt a lightness, a freedom. The city around me no longer seemed alien or menacing but vibrant and alive with possibilities. The ghosts of Tokyo had found their peace, and I, in turn, found mine. My time in this megacity had started with a search for stories, and it had ended with the liberation of souls, both theirs and my own. As I left the park, I glanced back once more. The cherry tree stood tall and serene, a symbol of enduring peace. 
a soft breeze played through the leaves, and for a moment, it seemed to whisper, a whisper not of pain, but of release and gratitude. Tokyo, the city of towering lights and deep shadows, had revealed its deepest secret, and I was its reluctant yet willing scribe. In the end, the stories we tell have power, the power to haunt us, to change us, and perhaps, to heal us. And as I walked away, the sun setting behind the skyscrapers, casting long shadows that danced just like the spirits of old, I knew this story, this adventure, would linger in the hidden corners of my mind, forever a part of who I was, who I am, and who I will be.